Do you want to add 25 mil, 50 mil? 29. Yeah, so dry agent actually means there's nothing added after the distillation process. Mm -hmm. So you distill our botanicals and then we water it down and bottle it. So the kind of concept behind downpour is that it's a downpour of flavour. Mm -hmm. So lots of citrus, lots of spice as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then heather flowers as
<laughs> my sister Helen's like, oh, don't tell me that. Like, <laughs> but I'm like, yeah, they do. It's not, it's not that they have a voice. It's more just the water. So it's like the, you know, the flatness of it. You know, I can't really. Yeah. Yeah, it's like long distances, day after day after day, which really takes its toll on your feet. You know? I think that's one there. I think so. Yes. Oh, it is. Yeah. I am. Um, yeah, he said that the lo the Loch Lomond bit. He was like, "Oh, is this actually like the path?" Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a few there, I think. Maybe two. Oh, oh they're all fakes. fakes. They're all fakes. Oh my god, that's a fake! I can't believe. <laughs> I can't believe it. And like, just kind of didn't think any more about it. And then when I realised that they did it. Yeah. Welcome back, I'm Kim. I'm Del. We are Going the Whole Hog and we hope you enjoyed our film from Uist. If you're planning your own trip to the islands or perhaps if we've inspired you to visit after watching this film, do keep watching because we're going to share some useful info about visiting Uist as well as uh, telling you all about the places that you saw in this film and our own experience on the islands. We also have a complete written guide over on our website, goingthewholehog.com. So if you're planning a trip to Uist, head over there for all the best things to see and do on the islands as well as practical tips like where to stay, where to eat, info for getting there, and handy map as well. Uist is the collective name for the islands of Eriske, South Uist, Bambekula, Grimsey, North Uist, and Burnery. They're all linked by causeway, so once you're on Uist, you can drive between all the constituent islands and you don't have to take a ferry. These islands make up the middle part of the Outer Hebrides, with Harris and Lewis to the north and Barra to the south. So you can get to Uist by ferry from Uig on the Isle of Skye to Loch Maddy in North Uist. That takes about 1 hour and 45 minutes. Or you can take the ferry from Malik to Loch Boisdale in South Uist. That takes about 3 and a half hours. There used to be a ferry from Oban to Loch Boisdale as well, but as far as we're aware, that's not currently operating. You can also take an inter-island ferry from Barra uh, to Eriske or from Burnery over to Leverborough and Harris. Or you can fly, there's a direct Logan Air flight between Glasgow and Benbecula. The landscape of Uist is made up of low-lying fertile macker and beaches on the west coast and rugged hills on the east coast with lots of sea lochs and inlets and loads and loads of little lochs inland as well. We'd recommend a minimum of four to five days on Uist, otherwise you're going to have to pick and choose quite carefully about the things you want to see and do. Unlike on islands like Harris and Barra, where you can see loads of beautiful beaches and really nice scenery just while driving around the main road, on US we would recommend definitely getting off that main road. All of the best things to see and do are kind of hidden down side tracks and you need to look a little bit more carefully to find them. And I think that's why this time leaving US we came away with a much greater appreciation for the islands compared to the last time when we were just cycling straight through uh, on the Hebridean Way and we didn't really leave that main road so our impressions this time were totally different to the last time. Our trip to Uist was part of a two and a half week camping road trip to the Outer Hebrides. We started in Barra, took the inter-island ferry over to Eriske, worked our way up through Uist and then took the ferry over to Harris and Lewis. We spent about three and a half days on Uist in the end. Uh, we didn't really have a set plan at the time, we were mostly just going off recommendations from friends of ours who live in North Uist of what to see, what to do. The whole plan got a little bit uh, jumbled because of a last minute decision of ours to go to St Kilda. So we had to get back down to Eriske from the north and then sort of driving up and down through the islands a couple of times. And yeah, it didn't really make the most sense. So the order of uh, places that we visited in the film version that you just watched is slightly different to the actual order of, of events as it were in real life. So if you want to see the behind the scenes version of it, do go and check out our Instagram stories. We've got them saved on the Hebrides highlights on our feed. And for now, we're just going to tell you a little bit more about our own experience on Uist and kind of the actual sort of day-to-day -day what we got up to. 
We took the early morning ferry from Barra over to Eriskate, left about 7am. We'd originally been booked on a ferry the day before actually, but we'd uh, decided last minute again to visit Mindley Island, so I'd had to change the ferries, which was super easy. I just phoned up Calmac and they, uh, there was availability on the Saturday morning, so they changed over the reservation free of charge for us. So it's good to know actually, um, if you are visiting the Outer Hebrides, it's better to get your ferries booked in advance, even if you're not totally set on the dates, and you can change them if there's availability free of charge especially if you're traveling with a car or if you're traveling in peak summer season. Um, better to have a reservation than to not have one at all and find out that the ferries are full. It was a moody morning by the time we arrived in Eriske, but it was pretty cool when we drove up and could see the football pitch with the, the fog out to sea. Uh, from there we headed to the causeway taking us over to South Uist. It was pretty handy that we bumped into a whole bunch of our friends at the causeway. They'd actually been on a staff day out to Mingley the day before, had camped by the causeway, and then we managed to get a whole bunch of tips for what we should see and do that day before we caught up with them later that night. The first of which was to head over to Loch Einart on South Uist, which was absolutely beautiful. Uh, we parked up at a little car park by the loch and then headed off on a walking trail. You can do like a five kilometer walking trail through the Croftland there. We just kind of did a little bit along the coast and then back again. It was glorious sunshine, so much so that I got totally burnt that day, didn't even have cream on. And yeah, really, really peaceful walk. Perfect for a little, a little short wander. Yeah, spectacular views over the loch and uh, we even got to see a seal as well. Oh yeah, there was a wee seal hanging out by the car park when we got back, it was pretty cool. Quite a big seal I think it was. Uh, looked wee through the viewfinder. <laughs> Next we headed over to Homer on the west side of South Hughes. Uh, there's a collection of old thatched roof houses, ruins of an old church and you can even stay in one of the old houses as well. Yeah, the Homer Hostel is run by the Gatliff organisation. Um, they don't take advanced booking, so you can just drop in and yeah, it's a basic hostel, but in such a cool location in actually that white wash thatch roofed house, which is very cool. Then we carried on north and took another right turn onto the road towards Loch Skipper, which was absolutely gorgeous. Such a nice scenic drive. You first of all go past uh, Loch. Uh, what was it called? Druidy Beg, I think. Loch Druidy Beg, yeah. And um, there's a location there that's part of the Outer Hebrides Bird of Prey Trail. So they've got some signposts and things for the birds that you can look out for, including like hen harriers and uh, golden eagles and things like mm. that. Um, it's a breeding ground, I think, for short, short-eared short owls as well, which we didn't see there, but we did see further up on Committee Road in North Uist. But anyway, there's basically a bunch of cool birds the highest hills on South Uist are there as well, so uh, Ben Moore and Heckler around there, all the locks, it's just absolutely gorgeous. So you can get out and go for a wee walk across some boardwalks and things there, um, and then just carry on down the road to where the jetty is at the very end. And who did we meet on the road still? Um, some Shetland ponies. We just stopped and this pony like came and stuck its head in our window. Um, I believe that pony's name was Murdo. We got a wee message on Instagram uh, after sharing some stories from Long Island retreats. Um, it's a couple who have a, a croft just at Lockskeeper and they have this herd of uh, wild Shetland ponies basically. And they know them all by name and all their little characters and stuff and uh, I think it was Murdo he said that one. Yeah, we saw Murdo <laughs> first and then the three of them came running uh, when we were parked further up the road. Yeah, so that was pretty cool getting to have a little encounter with them. And One of them had a bit of a Rod Stewart album in the 70s look. I think that was Myrtle. No, no, it was a different one that stick, uh, stuck the head in the car. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay, well, either way, the Shetland ponies are very cool. We missed them on Eriski, but got to see them up at Loch Skeever. Right. And again, it's a, a location for the Bird of Prey Trail, so um, there's good bird watching opportunities up there. We saw some red deer as well. And yeah, there's just this really cool old wooden jetty that's kind of crumbling at the end of the road there. Amazing views and old shielings and things like that. So again, good for a short walk, good for a longer walk if you want to go up into the hills. You can even walk all the way to Ushnish Bothy, um, but that's that's like an all day trudge through bogland. So we ended up not doing that this time. Apparently filming this outro for you is uh, so taxing, girls had to go and get himself a wee beer. Uh, don't mind him and his bad manners, where's mine? There was only one left. <sighs> Typical. Uh, anyway, next up was a trip to the North Uist Distillery in Nunting Steadings on Bimbecula. So the distillery is actually owned and run by our friends Kate and Johnny who we met in 2017 when we cycled the Hebridean Way together. 
And back then they had just returned to, to North Hughes, they're both from there but had lived elsewhere for years, so they just moved back and they were in the process of setting up the distillery. And it was so cool to go back five years later and see how much they've achieved and actually taste the gin that they've been making, which is excellent. I mean, you could have at least poured yourself a wee downpour to be drinking right now instead of uh, some... I don't have any downpour. There's some downpour in the cupboard. Oh, that's not ours. I know, that was a gift for someone else <laughs> whose house we're staying in right now, so we can't very well uh, Tap into the get gym. stuck into yeah. that. But as much as I would love to. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the distillery is uh, housed in this 18th century building, this old Steadings building. Or rather, at the moment, it is a shop and bar that is there, and they're in the process of moving the distillery into one of the wings. It's currently uh, elsewhere on North Uist. So when that is set up in, I don't know, a few months time or whatever, that's going to be absolutely amazing with all the stills in there. And then the other wing of the building, which at the moment is that cobbled floor and um, old stables that, that I was wandering around in, is going to be where they're housing all of their whiskey casks. So in the future, they are going to have whiskey and uh, all of them are going to be stacked up in there and it's just going to look so, so cool. So yeah, it's a very interesting building to go and visit. And of course, we would also recommend doing a little gin tasting when you're there. So they have what, three different types of gin? Four different? The classic, sort of, Scottish dry gin. Mm -hmm. What else did we try? Pink grapefruit gin. Well, you didn't actually try any because you were driving. You had to take yours away and drink I had the Negroni later, which is kind of like a liqueur type thing, but that's, it's a gin liqueur? Gin yeah, yeah, so they've got like a pre-mixed uh, gin Negroni, which we took a bottle off away because that's perfect for sort of camping at the beach and stuff. And they've got a slow and bramble gin as well. So oh, we've had that before. Yeah, so they're like three different types of gin plus the Negroni and they are all super delicious. And uh, they have like locally foraged heather and brambles that they use in the gin, which is quite cool because people go out when it's like uh, time to pick them all and they have to get it all in so quickly so that everyone in the community like will go out pick it all, bring it to them, and then they get uh, a bottle of gin in exchange. So it's like a barter system, which is kind of cool. So um, it was very nice to go there, pick up some goodies from the shop as well. They have uh, very nice t-shirts, totes. We left with one of each of those uh, and a bottle of gin as well. Yep. That's good. So we were getting lots of tips from Kate, especially about what to see and do when we were on Uist. And one of the experiences she said was a total classic US one that was to go cockling. And neither me or Del had ever been cockling. And I was like, what's that all about? And uh, it just so happened that our pal Kirsty was out cockling with her mum at that exact moment. So we sped on over in the car to Kirsty's house and uh, she showed us the ropes down on the, the tidal beach. Basket, fork, showed us what to look for on the sand. Two little uh, holes. Yeah. <laughs> Two little holes, a little squeaky sound, which is, I think she said it was like when the water was coming out of them or something, and it sounds like they're talking, which makes her feel really bad. I missed that part of the information. Yeah, I, I was there chatting to her about that. But anyway, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and then we took the cockles that we had uh, picked back to her house, and her mum made us some fresh cockle pasta, which was absolutely amazing. So just like a really nice little evening. And then uh, it turned out it was like 10 o'clock or something before we got to our wild camp spot across the beach that night. So I think uh, that's one of Johnny's favourite surf beaches. Mm. I think it's the only or the best surf beach on North US. So not that we were surfing, but uh, also happens to be a very good place to go camping. Yeah, we found a decent spot in the dunes. Although, yeah, it was like 10, 10, 30 by the time we got set up. But the beauty of June in Scotland is that that's just when the sun's setting. Even better when you're in the dunes. <laughs> exactly. So we've got a beautiful view looking out over uh, the Atlantic Ocean and we could just see St Kilda out on the horizon and the Monarch Isles as well, which was really, really cool. So next morning we woke up at gorgeous Foster Beach. Uh, it has a little fly around with the drone and just sort of took in the views with our coffee and whatnot and then uh, headed to... Val Ranald. Val Ranald. So Kate had recommended uh, the scallop rolls at the June's cabin and they did not disappoint actually. I had to wait till 11 o'clock for them to open. So I was like, Del, we need to we need to go to this cabin. So we were kind of hanging around and whoo, who would have thought that just sticking some scallops on a morning roll would be that good, but yeah, amazing. What did you have? Black pudding and scallops. I had black pudding and scallops. I actually don't remember, uh, don't remember. But then after all that waiting around for the food, we didn't really have time to do the nature walk. Yeah. But we did have time for a little wander on the lovely beach there. So Yeah, so the beach was just right next to the dunes cabin. So we went down there, had a wander. But yeah, like you said, there is um, a nature walk around the RSPB reserve there. It's like uh, maybe like a two hour walk or something around the coastline where you've got a chance to see otters and um, perhaps the very elusive 
Corn Creek, I mm -hmm. believe that's what they're called. Apparently they're quite rare, but there's a lot of them around there. So if you're into your birds and that, very good place to go and check out. Uh, we just used their toilet facilities, ate some lovely scallops, had a little wander on the beach, and then uh, we were running a bit late to go and catch up with our pals at Balshire Beach, which is beautiful. So Balshire is actually, yeah, another island linked by Causeway to North East and um, has a big long stretch of beach. Uh, it's pretty shallow, so it's good for a little dip. And uh, yeah, we met up with a bunch of friends there for a little cold water swim. Yeah. yeah, it is cold, but it is very rewarding and very refreshing. And as long as you've got something warm to put on afterwards, I would highly, highly recommend it. Anyway, so uh, after our little like afternoon get together on the beach and our little swim, we had some decisions to make. We were running out of time, and we had a list. Well, I was going to say as long as my arm, but maybe five things that we were like, right, do we go to Valai Tidal Island? Do we go for a walk around the Udall Peninsula? Do we go up to Clacken Sands? Do we go to Burnaby West Beach? Uh, that was maybe about it in terms of I think options. that was about it. All excellent options, all things that we really wanted to, to go and see or do, um, but we only really had time for one. So in the end, we picked Valai Tidal Island, which uh, was very cool. It's about a 30 minute walk out across the tidal uh, sand area. We left pretty much at low tide, uh, but you would definitely be better leaving, you know, maybe a couple of hours before low tide, so you're not like stressed out. Yeah, by way. leaving as in starting the walk over to the island. Yeah, yeah uh, because the whole walk would probably be about two hours in total, so it was a little bit stressy coming back. I was thinking, oh, the tide's gonna come in and we're gonna be stranded, but in the end it was all fine. But yeah, very cool island, it's uninhabited, and there is this massive like house on there which is left to ruin these days, but was built by uh, a guy called Erskine Beveridge, who was this, um, very wealthy linen industrialist guy from Dunfermline in Fife, which is actually just near where I'm from. And uh, he loved North US. He was like a bit of an amateur uh, archaeologist as well. So he'd done a lot of like archaeological digs on the island and yeah, spent a fortune building this massive house there, uh, which must have been quite the sight in its day. These days, the roof's totally like uh, caved in, but you can still see, you know, how impressive the building would have been. And I quite like how it's got crowset gables. I'm like obsessed with crowset gables. You always gables. mention the crowset gables. And when I was like, oh, I wonder if that's like a Fife connection because that's like a really popular feature in old architecture in Fife. As you know, Adele, after we visited Kudis. Yes. And you wrote all about it. Yes. So. Uh, uh, the architecture aside, the building aside, it is a really nice island. Uh, if you go over to the northern side of it. Yeah. Um, there's a really nice stretch of beach, so it's worth making sure you go all the way over to the other side of the island before heading back because yeah. that's really beautiful. There was tons of oyster catchers there, mm -hmm. there was a guy who had canoed in, not canoed, kayaked in and he was uh, camping there, so that would be a really nice spot to camp as well. Um, and yeah, beautiful, beautiful beaches and a very cool experience to you know do this walk out over the, the tidal flats and yeah. back again. By the time we did get back, it was, I don't know, half six or something on a Sunday. Now, there's one thing you need to know about the Outer Hebrides and Sundays. It is dead. Most places are closed. Um, or they, they don't open at all on a Sunday in terms of like shops and stuff like that, or it's reduced opening hours. So by this point, we were like, oh man, we need to drive all the way back down to Eriski in preparation for like a 7 a.m. boat to St Kilda the next morning. And we didn't have enough food for dinner or anything like that. I was like, right, let's phone up uh, a politician in Nevsky and book a wee table for dinner there. They were they, like, they were open. They were open, but they were like, no chance, mate. We're like totally full. Not that they said it like that. That would be very rude. But uh, yeah, no chance of getting a table there, fully booked. And I was like, right, we're gonna have to get to the supermarket. Supermarkets were all closed, so eventually we did find one open the co-op on the main road, uh, just before you cross the causeway from Benbecula to South Uis. Thankfully, that co-op was open till 10 o'clock at night, so we managed to fill up on some water and get some food and then bomb it all the way back down to Eriski and we found a beautiful camp spot on Prince's Beach uh, just next to the ferry terminal, which was lovely and sheltered, beautiful views, uh, but yeah, it was like another super long day uh, with that drive at the end, which um, we wouldn't normally have done if it wasn't for St Kilda. Yeah, of course, it was that. another super long day and great preparation for the next day, which was a super long day going to St Kilda. <laughs> I know it was great, but it was quite tiring at points, let's just say. 
So the next day we went to St Gilda, which we didn't share any of it in this film because we have made a completely separate film just focused on St Kilda and we also have a separate guide on the website about St Kilda but um, all you should know is that it's amazing and you can visit from Eddisgate with Hebridean Sea Tours once a week on a Monday uh, during season. Um, so if you do want to add in some extra cool day trips to your visit to Uist, St Kilda would be one of them and another one would be to Mingley. Uh, which is featured in our previous film from Barra and Battersea and Mingley. And uh, again, Hebridean Sea Tours go there. Uh, no, not Hebridean Sea Tours. US Sea Tours, sorry, go there from Eddisgate. Yes. So Mingley and St Kilda, two very cool trips that would be worth adding on to your US adventure. And uh, you can do them from Eddisgate. Anyway, so when we got back from our St Kilda trip, it was uh, already about half seven, eight o'clock at night or something. So we just found an amazing little wild camp spot by the Eddisgate to South U.S. Causeway. Uh, it was like oyster catchers circling all around us. It was the most beautiful night and uh, yeah, a really, really great spot. We also tried to go to Am Politician again. We, oh, actually, yeah. we actually went to the, the restaurant, bar restaurant, but they were full once more. So we had a bowl of muesli. <laughs> yeah, that was like such a disappointing dinner, but at least we'd had an amazing day. So we can't really complain. And we had a good view when we ate it as well. So. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, definitely book your restaurants in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, they're clearly very popular with both locals and with people that are visiting the islands. And there's only so many places to eat out on Uist and uh, certainly on Eriski. That's like the only place I'm a politician. So definitely book in advance. Um, next day, ah, yes. So we woke up uh, to the oyster catchers again by the causeway on Eddisgate and then just made a beeline north up to Grimsey for some seafood at the beautiful Namara restaurant. Oh, we stopped at the Kilbride Cafe first and had a, a morning roll and coffee there. I made it look like that happened on the first morning when we arrived <laughs> It's at all very confusing but if actually, you've just watched, yeah. You're right, we did have, we did have a cheeky wee roll at Kilbride's Cafe. Yeah. Anyway, so then we made a beeline for some seafood at the Mara, which mm. is on uh, Grimsey, so it's down at Killin Harbour there. And it's a very simple place, it's nothing fancy, it's just a no frills little seafood joint, but it is super fresh food and beautiful scallops, beautiful lobster and local like hot smoked salmon, crab meat, all of that. So Did we have a seafood platter? We did. We shared yeah. a seafood platter and then we also got some extra scallops because I just love scallops. And actually having spent like the last two weeks writing these guides and editing these films, like I, I can't stop thinking about scallops still. It's all I've been thinking about. In fact, while we're in Glasgow right now, maybe we should go to Crab Shack and get some scallops. Well, maybe they'll have scallops at the place you're going for dinner tonight. It's like Malaysian. I don't know. Uh -huh. I didn't know that. <laughs> Anyway, scallops, 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 amazing in the US and well, everywhere in the Irish Hebrides to be honest. So yeah, definitely check out Namara for some fresh seafood. Uh, Grimsey is also uh, a really nice little island. Uh, when we left there, we were driving around the coast and we just kept stopping for like all these amazing views. We could see Aval, which is the highest hill in North US. It's that kind of like cool, like very distinctive, almost like a conical peak. Um, and when we were there, there were all these beautiful little pink flowers that started blooming in like the kind of marshland areas. Yeah. So we just got out and had a little walk around there and we didn't know about it at the time. Uh, we only found out afterwards. Um, but there's a, a really nice wildlife watching like boat trip that you can do out of Killin Harbour and Grimsey. So it's actually our friend Johnny's dad who runs them. Nick is the skipper on this Lady Anne uh, boat. And you can go out and see like a white-tailed uh, sea eagle who's like resident in the area and uh, I think his name is Ronald. Maybe maybe he hangs out they, around they, Ronnie Island or something like that. Do they make an appointment? Yeah, they have like a little a little scheduling thing with Ronald. They'll be like, Ronald, what time are you going to be feeding mm -hmm. today? And then they'll arrange the boat trips. No, they don't actually. I'm just making that up. But uh, yeah, so if you are into your wildlife and you'd like to get a, a chance to see, you know, otters, dolphins, a sea eagle and whatever else. Uh, the Lady Anne boat trip is like two hours, I think it's 40 pounds per person and goes out like a few times a week during um, the main season. So that would be very cool and it's, uh, it's very nice around there. Totally different to the western sides, it's more like um, fishing and uh, you know like all the creels and the boats, fishing boats and stuff compared to the crofts which are all on kind of like the western side of the island. So it's interesting to see the contrast as well. Yeah. 
So after we'd finished our little tour around Grimsey, um, we just headed straight to our friend's house mm. um, in North Uist and got the chance to get a shower. And a bath with the most amazing view a bath, ever. And uh, basically have a little snooze uh, <laughs> and then just chill out for a little while before they came home from work. And then we just went down to the beach where we swam at the day before, a couple of days before, and had a barbecue there that night, which yeah, was nice. Yeah, that was really nice. So uh, again, there was like a list of things. We were like, oh, should we go up to Clackensand? Should we go over to Burnery West Beach, which are both meant to be like super beautiful beaches. But in the end, it was like, we're just too tired and we just want to chill in the house. So yeah. even having been to US three times now for me, or twice uh, for Dell, we've never made it to those Beaches, which are meant to be, yeah, I think Burnery West Beach was voted like the nicest beach in Europe or something uh, by Lonely Planet this year. And uh, yeah, still never been, but that is a reason for us to return. Exactly. And, uh, it is something that we would recommend that you go and see as well, um, because I'm sure it is beautiful. But in the end, we just chilled in the house and yeah, had a lovely, a lovely barbecue down on the beach with our pals. Got in for another little 8pm uh, swim in the water. I was getting right into it by that point and uh, and then yeah. I didn't I didn't head. go I didn't go in at all this time, I just um, flew the drone. So. You did make a slow bonfire on the beach. Oh, yeah. That was nice. And the next morning was our last morning on the island before we took the lunchtime ferry over to Harris. Um, and again we were like, right, which thing are we gonna do? And in the end we decided to follow up on a little tip from our pals and go and seek out this sort of natural plunge pool in the the cliffs on the western side near Sculpic and it was really cool so we wandered over there there was tons of oyster catchers and we were like right where's this plunge pool it was a little bit full of uh, algae so we didn't end up like swimming in it or anything but yeah it was it was uh, like carved out the rocks uh it's almost like a natural pool above where the waves are coming in and the coastline there was quite similar to what we saw later on around Mangursta on, on Lewis, but it was totally different to anything else that we'd seen on, on uh, Lewis. Um, very kind of rocky and rugged and it was a nice little spot. So so that was it, we took the ferry over to Harris and uh, we still had another week or more on, on Harris and Lewis after that, which you will see next time in the next instalment of this Outer Hebrides series. Thanks for watching, we hope you found it enjoyable and interesting and useful too. If you did enjoy it, please like, leave us a comment and subscribe if you haven't already. And don't forget to ring that little notification bell so that you're notified whenever we have a new video out. Thank you, as always, to our patrons. Your monthly pledges really do mean an awful lot to us. And if you enjoy what we do, you enjoy these films, you get some value from them, you get value from the guides over on our website, please do consider joining our Patreon community as well. It is one of the best ways that you can support us and help us to continue creating this kind of content in the long term. We'll see you next time on Harris and Lewis, where we'll visit the famous Calanish Standing Stones, have an amazing wild camp on Luskin Tower Beach, and experience everything that the Hebridean weather has to throw at us. Cheers for watching, see you guys next time. See ya. And uh, Del. Mm -hmm. I really do feel like this chair has done wonders for your bagpipe playing. There's been none of that at all that I have noticed. Because your arms had something to rest on, that is the key. It's comfortable, it That's is comfortable. That's what we need. That's what we need. Maybe um, we could ask CC and John if we could just come to their house and film these outros every time. Yeah. Or we'll just find another armchair, wherever we are. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Well. That's maybe a more practical uh, decision.